welcome to Switzerland. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a great pleasure to be here. <laughs> so, on the subject of Asia and of Europe, uh, should business leaders in this part of the world, in Europe, be optimistic or sceptical about the rise of Asia? I think they should be, uh, broadly speaking, optimistic about the rise of Asia. Uh, Asia is, of course, a very large area and contains a number of countries which are very different from each other. Too many Europeans and North Americans think of Asia as one homogeneous mass. It's not. Uh, and therefore, any business strategy for thinking about how to engage in Euro Asia needs to think, uh, focus differently on China, India, ASEAN, uh, um, uh, Central Asian states, the Middle East. Uh, these are very different uh, uh, countries with very different politics, very different market opportunities. But yes, broadly speaking, I think it's right to be optimistic, though not naive, because there are plenty of challenges in building business in Asia, and the Asian countries will find plenty of challenges as they develop in the coming decades. And you were um, Britain's uh, Minister of State for Trade and Investment. So how do you see trade um, developing in uh, between Europe and Asia? And what is your view on uh, Donald Trump's recent announcement uh, to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement? Well, it's not for me to comment on uh, um, yeah, American policy in one sense, but in another sense, it seems to me to be very unwise for uh, America to draw up the drawbridges. Uh, on the contrary, the, the, the right strategy, whether it's Europeans or Americans, is to be building the links. Uh, Asia is going to be uh, the world's biggest market over the next few generations. Um, there are opportunities. Um, I think it's important to engage both uh, commercially but also geopolitically. And uh, cutting links and not building bridges doesn't seem to me to be the appropriate strategy for the 21st century. So this really leaves a lot of the trade arrangements in, 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 in that part of the world up to China to take a leadership role at this stage. Do you think that is a, a good thing, and how do you see that developing? Well, China is taking a leadership role in a, in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, of course, it's a major voice in the G20, which has become the most important international forum dealing with economic matters. Um, secondly, the whole One Belt, One Road strategy uh, is a, in many ways, is a vision rather than a specific program. But nonetheless, it's, an, it's a, uh, the, the Chinese have grasped the enormous opportunity from the investment in the infrastructure to connect up Eurasia, by which I include everything from you know, the, the west of Europe to the east of Asia. Um, this investment in infrastructure in the coming several decades China's focused on the significance of that and their right to do so. It will provide a, an impetus for development for many, many millions of people. It will provide big market opportunities. It will provide a, uh, a growing experience of connectedness across the land mass of Eurasia, which we're all part of. So I think China's role in pushing that forward uh, and in becoming a more prominent feature of the world stage is both desirable and inevitable. Excellent. Yes. And um, of course, we've seen here locally in Switzerland, many recent acquisitions of uh, large scale organisations from the Chinese purchasing um, Swiss assets. How would you perceive that? And, and uh, would, would, is, that a, is that a good thing, a bad thing? What's, what's, what's going on here? And how should we perceive that? I think it's a good thing. Um, I think that uh, Chinese investment in European companies um, is a is often a good thing for the companies which need the new capital and the rejuvenation. We've seen some good examples of that around Europe. Um, uh, of course, in many cases, it's of uh, interest to uh, China's own development as it seeks to make sure that it's got access to the newest and most sophisticated thinking in technology. Um, uh, and, and that will, of course, over the longer term, provide some competitive issues for European companies. But that's the market at work. No, I think this is a good thing. It's also inevitable given uh, that China uh, has an economy with a strong surplus um, and it's likely to be an exporter of capital for a long time to come. Uh, this is not unique. Of course. This is what America did. Um, it is what Japan did. Um, it's what other European countries have done. Uh, it is inevitable that a successful economy becomes at some point in its evolution an exporter of capital. This is what we're seeing in the case of China. And 
China clearly uh, occupies a lot of the space when we talk about Asia, but so does India, as you uh, repeated earlier on in our discussions, that India is now the world's fastest growing economy. Fastest growing big economy. Fastest growing <laughs> large economy, mm. correct. Um, so when we talk about India, I had a conversation recently with Kiran Mazumdashaw, who built Biocon from uh, a startup to what is now the largest biotech company in India. Her message was that European companies need access to big markets. Would you, uh, would you agree with her or would you have any comments on how that can be accomplished when we see uh, this relationship between Europe and Asia developing over the next decade or so? Well, I think she's essentially right. I think Europeans need access to big markets. Um, those are big markets and they're big markets for good reason. There are a lot of people there who have aspirations to a higher standard of living, the kind of standard of living that so many Europeans take for granted, by the way. Uh, I think it's simply inevitable that over the next 30, 40, 50 years, uh, Asia is going to become more and more engaged internationally, more and more of a uh, of a market where there's not only a market for capital goods, which a lot of it's about at the moment, but increasingly consumer goods too, uh, as Asians seek to follow the same uh, aspirations, re re realize the same um, uh, ideals they have for their own children that we Europeans have done over the last 50, 60, 70 years. I think this is inevitable. I think it's exciting. It will not be free of challenges and there will be plenty of uh, risks associated with any given business strategy, but that orientation, focus, orientation is a good word, focusing east uh, is I think going to be a big mantra for a long time to come. This really is then the century of Asia. In many ways. Theresa May has now officially triggered Article 50. The second largest nation of uh, the European Union is set to leave the project. What are your greatest concerns for Britain at this stage with this new development? Well, to be clear, I voted to remain. I think the country made the wrong decision, but it, the decision has been made and the right thing now to do is to, is to work towards a new relationship with Europe, um, develop the opportunities that exist through having a, the freedom to negotiate trade agreements and other kinds of agreements separately with other countries, um, uh, as it were, to pull together and uh, get a sensible new relationship established. Um, this will be complex, will take time, um, but I believe that the uh, priorities that Theresa May set out in her Lancaster House speech in January and in the letter that, was, uh, that she signed to Donald Tusk uh, recently, uh, these priorities are a good statement of what Britain should be working on. I believe it to be in the interests of both Britain and the EU to come to a good understanding and a uh, a, com a comprehensive agreement on the way forward. So there's a new partnership. Um, I believe that uh, if we can get that right in the coming years, um, the result for Europe will be better than it might otherwise have been. Um, uh, and I mean that both, uh, both in terms of trade and commerce, but also more generally in terms of the other shared interests that Britain and the rest of Europe will continue to have by virtue of common geography and common history. Um, uh, all of this matters. All of this is going to be in the melting pot in these negotiations. It's in incredibly important to us all that this goes well. And so if you were to summarise uh, the, the threats that exist in that whole um, subject, what would those real threats be? Well, the threat would be if, 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 if we were to get to a position where a deal fails between Britain and the EU, to, to, take, to take the kind of extreme scenario, um, Britain in commercial terms falls back on the WTO uh, trading arrangements. Um, uh, it, it's, it's not the end of the world, of course, but it's not the right outcome either for Britain or the EU. Um, and there are so many other areas of cooperation which which might be put at risk by a failure of the negotiation. We all know that we need cooperation over matters like um, uh, common police cooperation over, over, over international terrorism, which knows no borders. Um, uh, there are so many other areas where, um, uh, where common, hu uh, common European endeavour is important. When you think of the Erasmus programme, you think of Horizon 2020. These are areas where 
um, Britain and come to that Switzerland, uh, want to play an active European role, whether or not we're members of the EU. Uh, it would be a real shame if all of that went wrong. Absolutely. And if, if we think about Switzerland's relationship with the UK, um, Switzerland is the eighth largest foreign direct investor into Great Britain. Uh, it is estimated that there are over 2,000 Swiss companies operating in the United Kingdom and that those companies employ 200,000 people. What would be your message to the business leaders that are running these companies? I think my message to them and to anybody else who's an investor in Britain is um, that the, in all likelihood there will be a reasonable deal with the EU. I, be, I believe that to be by far the most likely outcome uh, of the negotiations over the next couple of years. There, there, there is uncertainty in, uh, that will prevail for a while. Um, we, have to, we all have to live through that uncertainty, but that the outcome will be a strong, close partnership between the UK and the EU. Um, and of course, the other point is the UK remains a big market in its own right. Britain is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, it's a sophisticated economy with a broad base of activity. There's plenty of opportunity to do good business even in the UK. Um, and I believe that the relationship with the EU will be such that there will be a continued opportunity to see this as an intrinsic part of a European strategy. In so many ways, the UK remains a very good place to do business. London will remain uh, what it is now, one of the most cosmopolitan, if not the most cosmopolitan city in the whole world. Um, this is an attractive place to continue to look at for opportunity. When we talk about London and we cross that with the banking environment, there are three major cities in the world which are attractive for private wealth. New York, London, and Zurich. Would you agree with that? <laughs> well, I think they are all three uh, major cities in the world that attract a lot of interest, yes. I don't think they're the only three, actually. Um, but they are all important. Um, and, and London will continue to be a magnet for uh, interest from people who, who want, want residential property there, who want uh, business investment there, who want to hold private capital there. I think that will continue to be the case. We've We've seen in Europe uh, a wave of nationalist movements throughout many of the countries. The French elections are coming up. How do you, how do you perceive these developments and what, what, what uh, threats or opportunities do you see arising from all of this? There is a wave of populist movements in, in many European countries. You mentioned France, um, there's the AFD in Germany, there's the Five Star Movement in Italy. We've seen the Dutch elections um, in, in Eastern Europe, there are the Polish and the Hungarian governments. Uh, there are, um, uh, some people say in, in Brexit, something of a populist movement, although I think that the motivator for Brexit was rather different. Um, nevertheless, you've got these phenomena uh, which all tell you that there's a quite widespread feeling of a, of a disconnect between popular concerns and the elite and the Brussels milieu. Um, we don't yet know how this will uh, uh, affect European politics. French election could be quite decisive on this. Um, if it went one way, it's a, a big earthquake. If it goes another way, uh, it's more business as usual. I think it wouldn't be an unreasonable way of describing it. Um, uh, we've had the Italian constitutional referendum which will be followed in due course by a general election in Italy and we'll see what happens there. Uh, and of course you've got a German election later this year. I, I, I think the German election is unlikely to spring major surprises for the European project, very unlikely to. Um, we'll, we'll see. I, my, personally I think the most likely scenario is that Europe will continue to do what it's always done which is to muddle through. Uh, there appear to be big crises or big cliff edges looming and then it doesn't quite uh, get, get near enough to them to, to, to risk tripping over. Um, and it will go on um, in that way, as it has done if you look backwards over the last 10 to 20 years. Um, you're beginning to see renewed growth in the Eurozone, which clearly helps the political mood. Uh, you're beginning to see unemployment tick down. It's got some way to go yet, but nonetheless you've started to see the trends move in the right direction. So on the whole, I think the most likely um, uh, 
uh, forecast for the European Union is that it will continue to muddle through uh, and address these many and varied um, uh, challenges that it faces with, in, in a more or less disorderly fashion, but they'll get addressed. Mm. You have recently taken up a role of chairman of Asia House in London. I Perhaps have. you could tell us about Asia House, yeah. what its role is in the world, why um, you have decided or agreed to take up that role and what, what, what you're looking forward to over the next few years. Uh, well, why have I it's a very great honour to be asked to do it. Asia, Asia House is London's main centre for Asian affairs. It's a, it's a business supported uh, entity. Um, it is not a government entity and it does not take money from the government. Um, and to that extent is different from, say, Chatham House, which, which uh, many people will be aware of. Um, and its uh, purpose is to help uh, British businesses or, or European businesses that want to think about an Asian engagement to understand more about the Asian opportunities and challenges. So we run uh, um, events for visiting Asian dignitaries from, from many Asian countries and we'll run business breakfasts or evening uh, events. Um, we also believe strongly that you can't, as a business, understand what's going on in Asia and what the implications for your strategy are, unless you also understand something of the geopolitics, the diversity and the political challenges within Asia. Uh, so we, we look at, for example, developments in the Korean Peninsula, because I think they're important to understanding the dynamics overall in that part of the world. And we also run cultural programs, because we think that's important if you're going to understand the business you need to understand the geopolitics and if you're going to understand the geopolitics you need to understand the cultural background as well as it being fascinating and rich and varied so it's interesting in its own right so it's quite comprehensive the set of programs that we run um, i think in the 21st century a city such as london a great crossroads of the world ought to have a vibrant uh, uh, well-run well-researched well-supported asian center and that's what asia house is excellent yeah so perhaps you could reflect on your visit here to Switzerland. We did a, you delivered a public talk last night titled The Rise of Asia, question mark, and the Breakup of Europe, question mark. Perhaps you could reflect on that and the, the experiences you've had so far. Well, I've, we've had a number of conversations uh, last night, the, the, the lecture followed by the discussion, this morning at breakfast uh, with a lively discussion, uh, and a lot of interest amongst uh, Swiss business people in varying sectors of activity uh, in those two questions, the rise of Asia, question mark, and the breakup of Europe, question mark. They're both very topical. Uh, and they're interlinked, of course, because Europe and Asia are, in a sense, artificial human divisions of what is actually a single landmass, uh, um, and which is increasingly connected. So, so that over the coming decades, uh, events in Asia matter more to Europeans, events in Europe matter more to Asians. Uh, connections between the two will get ever more um, uh, intense and varied. And uh, therefore, to me, it's no surprise that there's a lively interest in these questions. Um, is Asia on the rise? Well, uh, yes, I think it is, but the specifics matter. And China's a very different story from India, which is a different story from ASEAN and so on. Um, and might Europe break up? I don't think it will, by the way. But the Brexit challenge, some of the other difficulties that we've mentioned, all of these are very topical and important to anybody who cares about um, their own business and activities and that of their children and grandchildren. Well, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you for participating in this film and our activities uh, here in Zurich over this pleasure. week. It's been wonderful having you. It's and a great pleasure being here. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.